Today's talk is going to be a, a little bit about, you know, it, I'll give you a little bit of context on why I, I talk about this topic. So I've, I've been in the MLOps space for quite a bit. We didn't used to call it MLOps at all. Um, but it's interesting. So there's a community online called the MLOps community. Um, I think I was like one of the first hundred people in it. And like this discussion around like, is it DevOps for ML? Is MLOps DevOps for ML? Is it, is it not? Like it's, it's literally been going on for years. And so what I figured I'd do is kind of talk a little bit about the process, what we're seeing, how we're building the software, uh, and uh, get, let you decide on kind of like why I think MLOps is so interesting and what it encompasses. So a little bit of context real quick. So name is Diego Oppenheimer. I'm an executive vice president at DataRobot. I run most of the MLOps teams there. Before that, I was the CEO and founder of a company called Algorithmia. Uh, we got acquired about seven months ago. And before that, I actually built some of the uh, largest BI products at uh, Microsoft, uh, including Power BI, Excel, SQL Server. So I've been in this data space for, for, for quite a bit and kind of seen the evolution of the different tooling and how it happens. Uh, and I see a lot of similarities. Uh, you know, it's, it's same but different, same but different. So that's where the half-truths come from. So there's this, always this question, right? How do I deploy this model? How hard can it really be? I mean, anybody can grab a container and build a Flask app and put an API, right? Like, there's, everybody can do that. It takes me, like, you know, two minutes reading a blog post on how to do that. I can do it on my laptop. I can get out to it. But the reality is, is that as soon as we actually start thinking about real-life use cases, things that have any sort of operational rigor, any sort of repeatability, anything that we actually need to scale, um, this becomes a lot more complicated. And deploying software is not a new thing. So you know, where is this coming from, and how are we actually thinking about it? So if you remember, and he just left, so that sucks, because I, all I wanted him to do is remember this slide. Um, but the, the core of it is, look, the one thing I want you to remember about today is that machine learning and production machine learning are completely different things. And this is really at the core of you have to think about it. And there's a lot of processes, a lot of architecture, a lot of concerns, a lot of organizational issues that you're going to think about, which just makes these things completely different. And so again, if you remember one thing before you leave today, it's just that title, and then I'll be happy. So DevOps is this set of practices, right? It's intended to reduce the time between committing a change to a system and the change being placed into production. So there's a philosophy around DevOps, right? It's around iteration. It's around responsiveness. It's around actual going through quick iterations and being successful at it. And when we start thinking about the principles of DevOps and the tooling behind DevOps, and we start thinking about, well, the software of the future is going to be powered by machine learning, right? Does anybody here disagree with that? OK, good. Hopefully. Uh, and so when we start thinking about it, it's like, OK, well, so then the DevOps of the future will have to take into consideration right, the concepts behind machine learning, what we care about, what, uh, you know, how, how data is used, and the differences. And at the core of it, and this is like the really most important thing, is the core of it is that we're changing between deterministic code and probabilistic code. Right? And that's at the, the core principle of the difference. Right? We are now dealing with probabilistic code versus deterministic code. And that actually makes us think that it's, hey, maybe there's principles, maybe there's things that we can repeat, but it might actually be different. So we've conducted, this is algorithmia, I say we still, like before we got acquired, we used to conduct this, uh, this, this survey, surveyed over 500 data scientists, machine learning engineers, VPs of data science. And you know, you've probably seen the stat sliced and diced in a million different ways. But the reality here is most data science teams, most ML teams spend way more time on infrastructure, on building out the infrastructure, on coding, on getting permissions, on getting the data access, on preparing it, than they actually do on any sort of modeling task. Right? And if you go think about, well, where the value is, well, it is in those modeling tasks and iterating over those modeling tasks. So how can we actually break down those problems and say, hey, where are the pieces that we can actually automate? Where are the pieces that we can get out of the way so that we can actually stick to the thing that brings the most value that we as data scientists and data engineers can actually say, hey, this is actually how we're going to go make you know, a value out of this technology. So I'm going to try to run like, a, just a quick comparison between what a traditional software development life cycle is and then what the machine learning life cycle is. And so you can kind of start seeing where the uh, you know, kind of differences, but also kind of like where the similarities can be and what we can borrow. So I'm, I'm big on borrowing from the past here because we actually can implement methodologies, we can implement organizational structures, and we can implement philosophies so that we can actually build 
AI, ML-powered software faster, more iteratively, and at a larger scale. So in the traditional software lifecycle, you know, we got Git, our source control. We might have our CI and continuous integration uh, pipelines, our Jenkins or GitLab. We might have our continuous deployment, which will be, you know, whatever, AWS, Heroku. And we might have our management stack where we're like, you know, Prometheus or Elk stacks, whatever it is what we're using for observability. So now we go into the machine learning lifecycle. I'm glad to say you can use Git or Git-like functionality. Uh, I think this, uh, if I would have this talk five years ago, uh, I would still get the weird eyes and be like, really, we're gonna use Git for data science? Um, you know, we have our test sets. We have our, uh, you know, general kind of like how we're actually gonna go run these deployments on GPUs or CPUs, um, or how we're gonna deal with those cold starts. And then we have that continuous evaluation lifecycle. So you can see like we have the stages, right, in terms of how we build, we train, we deploy. The question really comes in where the big difference is, is the speed of iteration. The speed of iteration at which machine learning actually goes through that life cycle is at least 10 times faster than what we go through in the software side of things. And that's when things start breaking. Right, because at this point, it's, it's that iteration speed. And we're gonna talk a lot about iteration speed today. So how is this all different? It's a continuous life cycle, right? So we go through the development, we build our models, we train our models, we get new data, we now deploy those models, scale them up, down, then we actually have to understand, you know, hey, when did it go down? What's our SLA? How do we manage these components? So not only is the ecosystem and the tooling, I mean, I think there was two days here packed with new tools, on how to do every single piece of the ecosystem. Um, but you know, we're actually seeing this, this life cycle that moves so much faster than the traditional way that we actually iterate through software. Um, and then how do we actually do upgrade? I, I was like, how do you upgrade your, you know, your machine learning model, right? Well, you're actually upgrading it consistently, right? Like, so you know, obviously the, the, the mecha is this continuous AI, the continuous retraining, but the reality is, is we're updating models, we're updating data sets, we're updating components in these uh, uh, pipelines all the time. And that adds complexity. Anybody who's here, just quick show of hands, who's actually operated a, you know, an actual like operational system, something that's like real time running that, you know, you pager. Who's worn a pager here? There you go, okay, so if it's not broken, you don't touch it, right? Like, like that's kind of like a core principle of it, right? It's like, if I'm wearing a pager, I don't want to touch it because if it breaks, it's a problem. So every single upgrade, every single change is like something that like gives you a little bit of a heart palpitation. Well, imagine if that should be happening every minute, every hour, right? And so this is kind of like where you start preparing your processes and your people to actually adopt to it. So one of the things that, um, I like being a little bit more interactive. Does anybody know what Boy's Law of Iteration is? Okay, great, cool, awesome, I get to teach something good. So, uh, so this is actually from like 1980s, so Boyd's Law was a colonel in the Air Force who was actually studying um, dogfighting, right? And so he was actually observing the dogfights between MiGs and F-86s, right? And what he came to the conclusion is that the speed of iteration beats the quality of iteration every single time. So if a pilot could actually make his decision process faster, he could actually go through, observe, understand where his enemy was, shoot, and just move quick, just quickly iterate through that process, eight out of 10 times would beat his opponent in a dogfight. And this is after studying tons of it. And you can actually see the studying of, of, of that dogfighting and that exact same principle actually repeats itself in sports training. It repeats itself in software engineering through agile development. And we see it also in software testing. And so at the core of it, iteration speed beats the quality of every iteration. And so how fast we can move through the system becomes core to how the, the quality of that actual system overall. And that doesn't change in the world of machine learning, except now we can actually iterate even faster. So when in doubt, iterate faster. And think about that entire workflow that you're going through and how quickly you can move through it. So, this is what a stack for machine learning looks like today, right? You obviously don't need all the components, but you have your notebooks, you have your core repos, you have your data engineering and orchestration layers, you have your data sources, your data engineering engines, sometimes you have labeling if you're working with unstructured data, you have your experimentation engines, 
You have your training engines, you have your inference engines and deployment. Uh, you have the monitoring, you have your feature stores for certain use cases. You have to put this all on a data infrastructure. So when you start thinking about iteration, like this is the workflow that your iteration has to work through, right? There's a bunch of tools that you need to combine that need to work in an ecosystem, and they need to go through this process as quickly as possible. Again, speed of iteration beats quality of iteration every single time. So, Probably not something that is uh, you know, crazy controversial here, but it is data is, is useless without algorithms. And the, you know, but algorithms are also useless without data. So you actually have to be able to feed in between these two things at any given time to be able to, uh, you know, to work with it together. So we're gonna walk through the process and I'm gonna talk about some of the technical challenges of this iteration lifecycle. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the organizational and people challenges through this iteration lifecycle, because both of them, and again, if you go look at uh, DevOps, DevOps is not tooling, it's a philosophy that has tooling, right? But at the end of the day, the philosophy behind it is really what the core of it. So we, we decide to become iterative through software, responsive and agile to build software faster. Well, guess this is the same way for actually building machine learning systems. So at the core of it, training and production systems are really, really different architecturally. So if you think about a training job, it's usually a lot of compute for a long compute cycle. It's usually stateful, hopefully, right? You're checkpointing, you're understanding, you're going through your training job. Um, it's exploratory. And in most cases, it's single user. I say it's single user because it's pretty rare to see multiple people collaborating on one training job. Right? It's like you, some, you know, somebody clicks the button, hey, go run the train, and there might be multiple, but that's really at the core of it. When you're thinking about production, you know, it's usually short, intense compute bursts, right? You're making a prediction, right? And whatever that prediction is needed, whatever that pipeline is, it's usually a short, intense compute burst. Um, you need it to be elastic. And the reason why you need it to be elastic, most cases, right, is because you have a one-to-many relationship, right? So if you think about every single one of your cell phones hitting a recommender system at the same time, right, because of your app on your phone, you know, that's what you're looking at, right? It's a one-to-many relationship there. So it's usually stateless. You know, my prediction is irrelevant for his prediction and his prediction. And it's usually, as I said, the one-to-many relationship. So at the core, you have two, from a computational layer, like very, very different architectures that you need to address for this automation in between the two parts. So how do I actually you know, bridge that gap between training and production? So you know, I talk usually about, and, you know, my suggestion is to use this kind of two git flow, right? Where you know, machine learning, as I said, um, unlike some of the kind of more common traditional software, actually most times has completely distinct code bases. So here's what I said, hey, it's same but different, right? Like it is not normal that the model, when I build in software, in traditional engineering, my app, I have it in tests, and when I deploy, is completely different. That's just not the case. But training code and inference code are, by definition, very, very different, and they behave in different ways. Um, and so we, people have that one repo for training and that one repo for, uh, you know, for inference is one way of splitting this, technically, in terms of understanding, but you know, then actually being able to tie those two things together. Um, so, when you actually want to do a deploy, you know, how do I easily package, deploy, but still be able to checkpoint and understand where that, where that inference is coming from? So then we have new challenges, right? Which is, we have new hardware, right? And uh, I don't know for how many of you have like, had the pleasure of uh, you know, working extensively with GPUs, uh, but until recently, like you ran out of memory on one and they blow up on you and you have to restart it and it's like, I mean, it's not, it's not CPUs, right? They don't have the controls of CPUs that you've had over like the last 30 years. Um, it's, you know, NVIDIA's made it a lot better. We have to admit that. Um, but you know, it's still kind of the Wild West. How do you control these machines? How do you control this? And then you still have to adapt it. Different chipsets, different libraries. What I'm training on, I might be using a certain chipset from you know, on, on, on GPU. I might be using a completely different chipset on, uh, on my inference. How do I actually reconcile these differences? So the complexity between these two sides of the house only increases. And then we have the beauty of containers, right? 
where, and this is my amazing graphic designer on a shared kernel, by the way. Um, so I, this is why I'm not in marketing. Uh, the, uh, so, you know, what happens when I have a completely, you know, one framework in one side of Docker container, I have a completely different one, they're sharing the same kernel, they're interacting with it. Like, dealing with these things from an operational perspective is highly complex. And understanding that, like, these things change. So going back to that first, you know, hey, I'm just going to deploy a model, you can see how this complexity increases over time. And then we actually get to the point where, hey, we actually are going to have completely heterogeneous tools and dependencies. So if you remember, and, and by the way, I actually do recommend, like, in my opinion, the best architected systems are ones that are tightly integrated and loosely coupled, right? So I can actually grab best-in-class components to build out my architecture, and I can pop in and out of those. I mean, I'd be able to do through it. Again, iteration speed beats all the time. And so how do I actually deal with the dozens of languages and frameworks and combinations? How do I actually deal with all the different hardware dependencies that I have? How do I actually deal with the different frameworks that emerge every year and I need to integrate into them? And so this is, again, why you start thinking about your production environment and your training environments as two separate uh, components, at least, so that you can actually start adopting and automating through those uh, two at the baseline. And then you, know, you have to start pipelining, right? So really, a model doesn't live in isolation. You know, I usually have a use case, and that use case is a pipeline of pre-processing and post-processing and splits and classification. And I need to be able to coordinate through each one of those steps in an automated way. And so now I have here, and I'm just a random example, where I have scanned documents, and I mean, maybe I do some OCR on it, and I get it. OCR is not machine learning. I'm just trying to show an example of, an, of a pipeline here. Uh, you know, language identification, text vectorization, some sentiment analysis. So what if I need to change any of these components, right? How do I, what, when I talk about that iteration speed, if I actually have to go manage every single one of these components independently and see what changed, what dependencies changed, where are those current, this is where this automation, this is where this philosophy around DevOps and that, around being able to think about the entire system and put, and this is where at the core, I believe MLOps is, right? Which is that automation, tracking, auditability, governance of the entire way you're building your pipelines becomes core. Because at any point, any of these things can go south. You're iterating faster on any of these components than you ever have on any other piece of software. So then we actually have to model performance, right? And so this is obviously like particularly important. So what does performance mean in the application world? Well, in the application world, it might be an SLA. It might mean that I'm actually being able to scale you know, horizontally, like to be able to take the request. Well, performance in the world of machine learning has a bunch of different meanings, right? Am I losing accuracy? Is my data is drifting? Is my comps it drifting? What am I actually, you know, it's also SLAs. So now you have this definition of performance that has multiple different vectors around it that you also need to be like monitoring for. So this is why those monitoring tools and those uh, are, are also same but different, right? So like, there's a reason why we don't just, you know, slap uh, you know, a data dog onto your machine learning model. You can, you can write a bunch of code, but you know, there's a reason why these specialized tools are coming in to be able to actually look through the, you know, the monitoring components of, of performance for these individual models as that, uh, you know, uh, statistical code is actually being run. So where are the tests, right? So again, like this reason, like if we're gonna actually be moving this quick, right, how do we put safeguards in it? Like unit testing for ML, I like that. Anybody write unit tests for their machine learning models? I got one. That's, that's actually impressive. I, like, I've actually asked this question. This is the first time I actually got one hand. Uh, but it's absolutely possible, right? So as you think about, you're thinking about this two git workflow, and you're actually checking in new inference code, and you can actually write unit tests to actually go check baseline for those models as they get like, compressed and deployed and run. You can actually start running smoke tests. You can start running performance tests. Those performance tests are not just about the model accuracy. They're also about that SLA, about that operational, about the scale out. So you can start thinking about, okay, well, I'm building these major systems. How do I actually start borrowing, again, these concepts from the world of DevOps and philosophy of the world of DevOps so I can increase my confidence on the iteration speed? Because at the core of it, this isn't about tooling. It's about increasing confidence so you can move as fast as possible. 
So I usually like use this really, really corny phrase, so you're gonna have to deal with me. But as like, I say, like the path between you know, training and production today and machine learning is a dirt road. You want to build the Autobahn, right? Why do you want to build the Autobahn? Because the Autobahn, you feel confident that you can go as fast as you want on that, right? And you're, you know, if you go as fast as you want on a dirt road, you are going to skid out. But also, the Autobahn has controls, it has rails, it has pavement, there is actually police that are looking at it, there is toll roads, right? And so the, the, you know, the, the governance, the control, everything around the system is giving you the confidence to move through that system a lot faster. So this goes to that point, right, which is around audit, auditability and governance. How do I go call out and say who called, what, wh when, with what data, and why? I want to be able to go back and replay that. That audibility and confidence, first of all, it's crucial for debugging. When, when something goes wrong, as you have to go spelunking into what went wrong, so you have to be able to provide those logs and be able to go back in time and understand it. But also, it's a core component about building confidence on iteration speed. If you know that you will be able to find what went wrong, you will care less about the quality of the iteration and more about the speed of the iteration. And again, that is where you want to end up. So I think in this crowd, I don't actually have to talk about this, but like I usually have to explain you know, how, what, how, what model drifting looks like. If I all had images of people in the summer, and that's all I trained my model on, and then suddenly I you know, had a winter picture, it probably wouldn't know what it's looking at. Right? And that's just the idea that also this is a unique challenge in the world of machine learning, which is nothing can change in the code base, and yet everything changes in the system. And so how do we actually think about that and start apply, again, apply those, uh, those, the, the principles of DevOps, but you can't just apply all the principles. You can't just assume it's going to work in the same way, and you can't assume you can use the same tooling for it. And so introspection is so important around this, right? And so everything from monitoring to logging to alerting to observability. So hey, who gets called? So I got a couple of hands on the pager uh, you know, when, when, on that. It's very rare to have a data scientist have a pager. Some places do, right? But it's really, really rare, right? So now this concept is our SREs who are running these systems. And now there's this concept of a machine learning, MLRE, which is a machine learning reliability engineer who's actually understanding, hey, where do I go look when some of these systems go wrong? Because at the core of, you know, if we're actually successful, and I believe we are going to be in making all these systems be mission critical, because the world's going to run on machine learning and all software's going to run on it, the reality is, is that there's going to be situations where if something doesn't get fixed, we're going to be in risk of reputational damage, you know, making decisions who are going down, operational damage to the organization, lose a lot of money or not make enough money, whichever one you want to pick of those. Um, and the, on the other side is there's the risk of not doing anything, right? If I don't apply machine learning, you better believe that my competitors will. So you have to do it. You have to approach it, and there's also risk. So how do you build those guardrails? And that's really around that introspection. So how do you get the logging, the monitoring, the alerting, and the observability around it? So at the core of it, you know, what I talked about, that Flask app with an API, there's a little bit more to it, right? Especially when you're actually doing it at scale for real-time systems. Um, and a lot of times it's economically challenging, not for the technology. So I covered all the technology pieces. I think you all understand here that there is a lot of technology to go take into account. But in a lot of cases, it's really about people and what's happening in it. So it's a lack of process. It's the wrong incentives from those organizations. It's the wrong teams. It's the wrong technology. And then the critical, which is any sort of technology buy or implementation, without the lock, with the lack of proper champions, it's dead in the water no matter how good it is. So how do we actually tackle these problems? And this is kind of my... Uh, you know, I, I like I say, it's like these are the scars of uh, <laughs> the scars of time that have like you know kind of developed how to kind of tackle these large scale build out of systems and, and how to do that. So when you're thinking about the stuck of the lab, right? And you've probably heard about it. This is not a new concept, right? Like oh, machine learning is stuck in the lab, like nothing gets out, no data models. Well, the core of it is that there's a cemetery of proof of concepts in in, in data science, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. The only thing is the bad thing is like the ones that actually should have gone to production and didn't because they were planned incorrectly. Anytime you are looking at a data science project or a machine learning project, and I do use those interchangeably even though they can be quite different, um, 
you need to go look at and say, okay, how is this gonna work in production? That's the first question. Where is this gonna show up? What system are we gonna be running in it? Because if I don't actually map backwards, I don't care how much time I spend building the most accurate model on Earth, it's never gonna see the light of day. So you have to be able to map your way all the way back. So is this gonna be a recommender that's running on our website? Great, okay. What's the traffic of that website? How we're gonna deploy it? How are we gonna actually get it into that, into that front page? Who's gonna maintain it? Who's the SRE gonna? These are all things that you wanna know or at least have a brief map of before you even go look at the data. And this rarely happens. This really rarely happens. So, you know, you have this concept of, you know, we train models and we show this concept, but there's no way to it. So the business is just sitting there. And by the way, you know, as most of you hopefully know at this point, who carries the purse for hiring more data scientists, more machine learning engineers, bigger investments, bigger tools, better tools, more compute, more CPUs, more GPU? It's always the business, right? Because that's the, you know, one's a cost center and the other one's not. And so if you can actually show the results to the business and they don't care about it, they don't really, you know, I, 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 they don't care if it's 100 monkeys coding, like on their own, or the best machine learning system in the world. If it produces the same results, it's the same results. Right, and so you have to be able to map how you're gonna get those results so you can fund the rest of the journey. So the disconnected teams is really interesting. So I, I think the, this was the really part that was really telling for me over time was how many times I would go into it, uh, you know, help out a large enterprise in terms of the machine learning project, and I would say, hey, can you invite, I'm meeting with a VP of data science and the data science team, and we could talk about all the concepts in the world, and I'd say, hey, can you invite your IT counterpart? They look at me like, what are, you, what are you talking about? It's like, yeah, like who runs IT here? Like who provisions the permissions? Who's gonna give you access to the databases? Who's gonna let you like get that AWS, like, you know, launch those like three instances on AWS? They were like, oh, we need to talk to them? I'm like, yeah. <laughs> You're not gonna get anything here done ever. And he's like, well, well, we'll call them later and we'll tell them, it's like, yeah, that's not how this works. Like you're gonna get nowhere. So you need to actually have those, you have to bring in you know, this idea that a data science, an effective data science team can work in isolation, throw their work over the wall, and have it automatically show up in production is a complete fallacy. And if it works, it's painful, right? And so you have to get into this world, it's like, okay, who is the right skill set? Who are those pager people? You know, I say this with all the love in the world about it. SREs are like, you know, godsend. Uh, you know, but like, you know, like who are the people writing the, the, the pagers? Who are gonna be, who owns that production pipeline? Because if you're not talking on day one on how you're actually gonna get through this system, you're never gonna see the light of day. And so you have to start planning around that, how that collaboration is gonna work, what the actual responsibilities and the accountabilities are between those teams. So, for you know, another law, um, um, uh, which is, you know, the, in a lot, Conway's law kind of talks about how organizations which design through the constraints of their organization will actually like just copy that communication. So if your team is not talking to the DevOps team, your systems aren't talking either, right? And so you need to understand who the responsibilities for each component is gonna be how we're gonna actually get those models built, built out. And again, this is, as you can see, I've been talking about you know, MLOps and DevOps, and I'm not talking about technology anymore. Like this is really an organizational change and a philosophy change for effectiveness of actually getting machine learning teams to scale and actually being able to get these things in production. So then we have the technology mismatch, which is lack of defined technologies or stacks or best practices, um, Everybody builds their own thing with absolutely no repeatability, measurability, or auditability. So, hey, I just got it running. Somebody else maintain it. You know, the lack of hit by a bus mentality, which I know is a really awful thing to say, but, you know, you have to plan your systems that, like, the person who wrote it will not be there tomorrow. Um, you know, you're not thinking about the access to data. You're not thinking about these differences between production and development. And so what is the best ML architecture for my organization is something you legitimately need to be able to answer. And it's an iterative process and you wanna design around it. And so you, know, you can kind of actually look through what are the different components and there's a lot of tooling out there. And the answer is, it depends. It depends on your organization, it depends on what your use cases are, 
but the reality is that you want to start having an opinion around a canonical stack of tools so that you can start taking advantage of those economies of scale. And so, like with any sort of application, having no stakeholder buy-in is just a death trap. And I'll explain the situation where this happens more often than not. So I just talked about, hey, bring your IT folks uh, you know, in, bring your people in, bring all these people, bring all in. Well, guess what? We live in a human world. At some point, you're going to get stuck. At some point, you're not going to get the access, or there's going to be some rule that is like, you know, backwards. Something is going to be. And a champion, and a champion with authority inside this ecosystem, somebody who cares about this workflow, this application, and what you're doing here, becoming, seeing the light of day, will be that person who unblocks. Right? And so I always tell my teams, I say, hey, great that you're talking to the VP of data science. It's great that you're talking to the VP of IT. Who do they connect with? Oh, it's a uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, talk to that person. Because at some point, you're going to have to call that person. And they're going to have to unblock between the two places. And that's how you're going to actually get your application in production. That's how you actually get your workflow in production. So how do you get you know, your buy-in from your stakeholder? Well, you make it personal. <laughs> What's in it for them? We are, you know, we're humans, right? It's all about, you know, we can design systems where everybody's greedy, right? We're looking out for our best interests, but you can actually design systems for that to actually be for the greater good. So how do we actually get out of the lack of process? So, you know, you want to plan and fund deployments up front. You want to set clear deployment criteria. Again, how are we actually going to get to production? What are the conditions of production? Um, you want to bring in your stakeholders really early, and you want to build for repeatability in your process. And so I did not invent this, but it's actually one of my favorite uh, like devices that I've used in building out not only large-scale projects in machine learning, but also teams. Uh, so Ian Xiao, he's a consultant. Um, he knows that I borrow this all the time. I use it. I love it. So if you know the concept of an MVP from you know, the minimal viable product, from product and agile development, I think of the concept of, in, in machine learning is the minimal justifiable improvement tree. What is the minimal improvement to a process, an optimization, or a decision, automated decision making that it's worth the investment that I'm about to go do in people, technology, and time? And the way that you actually break that down is say, well, what's the objective? Okay, if I can actually price a bond better, right, and I think I can make $2 million a year by doing that, is it worth investing $4 million to do it? Maybe, depends on how many years, right? And so you have to start with, the, uh, that, with that objective, which is what is the improvement I'm gonna get to? What is the value that I'm gonna see out of this and understand that on day one so that I can actually put into concept the whole rest of the, of the pie. In this case, it might be, okay, what's the business process to getting that through? What are we changing? What are we automating? Is this a back office operation that we're actually gonna go touch 300 different systems by automating it? That might be good, that might be bad. What's the access look like? So now I can actually start costing everything in our head around this whole project, again, starting from the end, going to the beginning, in terms of, okay, what are we actually doing with this and what are we gonna actually get out of it? You have the organizational, you have the financing, the budgeting, and then you can see that actual technology is all the way at the bottom. So now I know what the process is gonna look like, I know where this is gonna show up, I know what the target optimization or objective looks like. Now, I'm ready to start looking at the data that I have. Do I have the right modeling techniques? Can I actually model it? Do I have the right technology and what am I gonna go build it? So I'm just curious here, how many people have started this way versus the other way around? Most people, I'm just gonna take a while guess, including myself, have usually started bottom up here on this, right? Oh, what's the data I have? Let me go see what I have. I haven't really figured out how I'm gonna get all the way through it. So increasing success is really about thinking about the process you can build around this and actually looking at those objective functions. So to kind of start wrapping this up, you know, ML is a huge growth race. It's really difficult and expensive for DevOps to keep up. You know, you start out with a few models and a couple of frameworks and one or two languages, probably Python and R, you know, you start with a dedicated hardware, VM hosting, 
self-managed DevOps team, hey, we can do it, we got this. You know, you have that unicorn machine learning engineer who somehow knows how to do literally everything, right? And she's there and she can grab data and she can model and she can deploy and she can use AWS and she can do everything and that's, there's like three of her in the world. You know, you have a high time to deploy, you know, like uh, around this, you have few end users, um, no need to really auto deploy, you know, common API. Now, I go into the forward and I look at how this is going to start accumulating, right? So I go from that few users, right? The f dedicated hardware, the high time to deploy, everything's manual, to well, what happens if suddenly tomorrow I have 15 more use cases? And you know, I think there's only, there's, there's a couple of like definite truths. Tomorrow there's gonna be more models in production than there is today. I think that's not really controversial. And so you can see how this starts scaling out. You have to build for repeatability. You have to build for the iteration. You have to build for the automation. There is, this is not a manual scale out that can happen inside an organization. And the beauty about machine learning as a technology is that it could literally be implemented anywhere and everywhere. So this isn't a question of like, oh, this is just in the software team. You're going to be seeing this in finance. You're going to be seeing this in marketing. You're going to be seeing this in, in, uh, you know, in, 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 in the traditional software development. It's everywhere, right? And so the scale is going to be like, this is the software of the future. So we have to start thinking about how do you scale that out? How do you automate through it? So think of the things to consider when you're building ML systems in enterprise. Infrastructure agnostic deployment. What's under you might change. Collaboration and pipelining. How do I use components from different parts of the business? How do I actually collaborate between different parts of the business? What are the performance SLAs that are gonna be required for this to be a real use system in, in real life? Um, if you are in you know, financial services or life sciences, like you probably have some level of regulatory compliance. So model risk management, how do you generate the explainability of these models are becoming more and more important. How do I actually do governance? And what I mean by governance is how do I secure? And if you think about the traditional IT governance, which is around security and auditability and ability to tie expense to strategy, these are all things that are also important in the world of ML. Accounting, who's paying for it? So in a lot of organizations, so this, some of this stuff can be really expensive compute-wise. Really, really expensive. And so if different parts of the businesses are using it, who's paying the bill? Great, so you wanna share the bill. Okay, well if you're sharing the bill, how are you attributing what's being used for you? So you have to now start thinking about, again, none of this is data science or machine learning. I know this is not sexy, but you gotta pass the bill to somebody, right? How do you actually do that accounting of these pipelines? And then obviously security and authentication. So how do you navigate these pitfalls? And I'll kind of close it out, which is don't reinvent the wheel. There's a whole bunch of uh, components out there there's a whole bunch of tooling out there. Like your job is to think about what the full use case looks like, how are you gonna get there, and what are the best tools to get you there. Um, don't try to be perfect. I'll go back to Boyd's Law, right? Iteration speed will beat iteration quality every single time. And then tools are not solutions. And then be honest with yourself, right? The tool that you used yesterday might not be the tool that you use tomorrow, and that is okay. You do not need to plan for the next 10 years when the software is being improved every 10 months, if not faster. And so start thinking about, okay, what parts of these systems can I pop in, can I pop out, what am I gonna be using, what is the fastest way to getting that result? So I asked you to remember one thing when you started, which was that one slide, which is machine learning is not production machine learning. And now you can see how, like, really, when you're thinking about production machine learning, a lot of it has nothing to do with the latest and greatest, you know, archive paper. And it has nothing to do with some of the greatest techniques or the latest framework that came out. It's actually about thinking how we're actually going to get to speed and scale on what is really the most amazing technology that we're probably going to see in our lifetime. And that is all I have for you today.